Satajit Das is a financial markets expert and he's the author of Extreme Money. He's with uh, Alex Tarrant. Alex. Well, thank you, Mr. Das, for joining us from Sydney today. Uh, you, you were one of the original doomsters and gloomsters in the lead up to the financial crisis. Um, basically, what's gone wrong? Why haven't we fixed it yet with this LIBOR scandal? What's, what is there still to come and what's gone wrong? I think you've got to go back a little bit. I think fundamentally the problem is the world just tried to grow very, very quickly from the 1980s onwards. And we used an accelerant, which happened to be debt. Now, there's nothing actually wrong with using debt to grow the global economy, but the problem is we just had too much of it. And that there's reaches a point where you just can't keep pumping more and more debt into the economy. To give you a number, which is actually quite useful, is look at the United States economy. In the period from 2001 to 2007, roughly half the debt, half the debt, uh, I beg your pardon, half the growth, was driven purely by debt in the United States. And today, China, on whom, say, New Zealand and Australia and many other economies depend for their own growth, needs 6 to $8 of debt to create $1 of growth. So what has to happen? And well, the debt's got to come down. And that's fundamentally what's got to happen. And it's got to be over a long period of time, it's got to actually come down. But the problem is, in 2008, when this problem started, what everybody sort of said was, OK, well, we have to bring the debt down. Then they realized the consequence of that, which is you get locked into a period of economic stagnation with no growth, massive unemployment and so forth. So what happened was we switched the debt from private balance sheets onto government balance sheets. Mm. And what you're seeing in Europe now is the start of a massive unwinding of government debt. And I think what we, the world's going to see is a period of what we call deleveraging, which is a gradual runoff of this debt, which is going to take a very, very long time. And the world is going to be mired at best in a period of very low or no growth. And that's going to have huge implications for investors, for companies, for governments, and basically the social structure, because it's very difficult for us to hold a society together, which is addicted to growth to some degree, where we can't grow anymore. So what does that mean for us down this end of the world? You're in Sydney, we're in New Zealand. We're banking on China to keep growing at 7 to 8%. Uh, we're, we're banking on, on Europe to, to not have such a deep recession. What does it mean for us down here in terms of our growth prospects? Well, I think the fundamental thing is we're not going to be immune. I think Australia and New Zealand were very lucky because in the first phase of the crisis, when the problem started, China inflated. Now, everybody thinks China is growing at, say, 8 or 9%. I'd question that. And let me explain why. If you actually look at their growth, you have to look at how that growth is being created. To create that 8 to 9%, the government, through its state-controlled banks, is pumping in roughly 30 to 40 percent of everything China produces every year in the form of debt. Mm. Now, we all know something like probably a quarter of that is never going to come back. So this is the property bubble that's roughly bubble 10 percent of GDP. I, no, it's not a property bubble. I think it's malinvestment as much as anything else. Property is part of it, but I'm not so worried about the property bubble. I think they just build bridges to nowhere, roads which go nowhere. Ghost cities. And that's not going to produce. And if you deduct the cost of those bad debts from the growth, they're not growing anywhere nearly as quickly. And at the moment, what the world is relying on is you can keep doing it. And I don't think you can. So I think we're going to see the ripples from that storm in places like New Zealand and Australia. New Zealand less than Australia, because New Zealand isn't a mineral producer. Australia relies on its iron ore and its coking coal. You rely on foodstuffs. And people are still going to have to eat. So it's mm. not all gloom and doom in that sense. OK, well, we've just been told the government wants to increase its um, mineral explorations. That demand seems to be coming off from China, doesn't it? And th there's talk now in the last week that the Australian mining boom will only, has only got another two years left in it. What does that mean? Well, it's actually quite amusing because the person who actually said it had two years uh, left in it about a year before had said it was a super cycle which would go on for 20 years. <laughs> okay. So basically, you know, as you know, economists were put on earth to make astrologers look good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, so what is going to happen in Europe? We're going to see stagnation for, what, 20 years. That's going to flow through to China, flow through to us, really, isn't it? So. In, indeed. In Europe, I think it's kind of interesting because... You're, in Europe, I think you're sh seeing signs that you're going to see elsewhere. One is, it's very difficult to solve a problem of debt with more debt, but more importantly, if you don't have any money, what most people seem to miss in Europe is everybody's shuffling the same money around in different ways. The only way you solve this problem is a massive injection of money, and there isn't any. 
And everybody's talking about, well, Germany should take responsibility for all of this, and the richer countries should take responsibility for all of this. But the fact of the matter is, de facto, all the debt has been mutualized, and the Germans are going to suffer a catastrophic loss of wealth. And so, basically, overall, Europe will have to sort of muddle through. Mm. But the best way to think about it, it's like a chronic disease now in Europe, and it's going to be a chronic disease elsewhere. We can manage it take a few aspirin, call Dr. Bernanke in the morning, and basically sort of it just muddles along. But every once in a while, you're going to have a life-threatening emergency. Right, so we, we've and muddled through... Sorry, we've, we've muddled through for 20 years, let's say. What kind of policies do we have to put in place to stop this hap happen again? Do we, we have to completely change the way we approach growth and, and debt and, and how we deal with it, surely? So well, what think, do you think needs to be done? Well, firstly, I think you've got to have a very, very controlled deflation in terms of the debt bubble. But you've got to definancialize the system. We came to rely on financial engineering rather than real engineering to drive the economy. We've got to go back to the things that matter. And you look at the growth. It has to come from innovation, from productivity. And it's not as if there's a shortage of problems in the world to solve. We've got to solve the problem of feeding people. We've got to solve the problem of clean energy. Mm. We've got to solve the problem of things like water conservation. And one of the most important things that is neglected is essentially logistics because we actually have a lot of stuff which is wasted because it can't get to market. So there's a lot of problems to solve, and we've got to go back to that. And finance has to become the handmaiden, not the driver of the economy. You cannot build a world on debt. And that's what we've tried to do unsuccessfully. Right. And that's the thing that's got to change. But nobody seems to actually want to even address that. So it's, it's about taking the risk out of finance, isn't it? Really, and Indeed it is. And as you saw from the uh, recent scandal that you mentioned in LIBOR, it's not even risk. In some cases, it's just outright fraud and manipulation. Mm. OK, and so we, we take the risk out of finance. Banks become intermediaries again. Indeed. Right. And so that needs legislation to do that. What, are you confident that's going to happen? Or are the regulators, in effect, captured by the regulated still? Well, Thomas Pynchon, the writer, once said, you know, if they can get you to ask the wrong questions, the answers don't matter. And the politicians are masterful at that. And to some extent, particularly in the United States and Europe, the banking lobby is just so powerful. They're preventing the right questions being asked. I'll give you an example of that. In the United States, there's a rule called the Volcker Rule which is designed to prevent banks from trading with their own money. Mm. But the problem is the rule has been watered down and made so complex, it's 270 pages long. And he's got loopholes everywhere. And I had a lovely conversation with a lawyer who said he'd be embarrassed if he couldn't get his clients through at least one of the loopholes. <laughs> so essentially, we are not really making any progress. There's a lot of activity, but I'm yet to see much achievement, though recent events like the LIBOR scandal might actually galvanize people to do that. I live in hope. Right. So it could be a big kick up the rear, really, for, for some people, this LIBOR scandal, which has still got some room to run. So, oh, I think we're only 10% into it. And the losses to the banking system, not from the fines, but from the lawsuits that will follow, will be colossal. And, you know, if you actually look at it from the point of view of investing in banks, not so much New Zealand banks and Australian banks who are at the peripheries of this, but European and American banks, one of the fundamental problems you have is you don't know how big these losses are going to be. And at the same time, they need, obviously, to raise money in different forms. It's going to become very difficult. And perhaps this will be the catalyst for what we call the definancialization, because people start to realize there's no much point in running the banks the way they have been run in the past. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Das, for joining us from Sydney.